Um, so what we're talking about today is some work that Glenn and I did a few years back um, that I haven't really seen duplicated in the community before or since. So my name's uh, Pete Senange. Um work at uh, Third University that you might have heard of, ends with Aronto, um, in the Information Security and Enterprise Architecture Group. Prior to that, Glenn and I both worked in the Network Management Group for the Central IT Unit. And we had a situation where the edge networking devices uh, that served the campus, all 300 and change of them, we went to end of life, and it was time for a, an equipment refresh. This is our, the, our uh, story that will be uh, embellished as we go to describe the trials and tribulations. What I'd like to talk about is, a to start with, a little bit of the philosophy of how I look at problems, um, the background, the context, if you will, of where everything uh, fits. Um, looking at the specific problem, getting our switches initially configured so we could do useful things to them, how we found them, what the processes were, what the requirements were for a solution, um, what components that we had to work with to make a solution, and how we architected, architected them together. Uh, our second problem had to do with how do we track changes to switch configurations, and again, um, what are the requirements of our solution, what are the building blocks that we have to work from, and what architecture did we put forward. But a, a few take-homes after that, uh, things we learned the hard way, and an overall summary. Uh, Guido Van Rossum, creator of Python, if I recall correctly, is credited with describing either programming or computer science as we do things with stuff. Um, that definition has stayed with me because it, it the, the placeholders are, are useful for me. Um, you're probably all familiar with this notion of DevOps, development operations, and how in the, new, the current world, we don't really have uh, a site, a piece of software, a tool as an end state, merely it's, it's always a work in progress and we develop the means by which we can continue to iterate, to update, to improve it. So continuous integration means that we need to make deployment cheap, easy, repeatable, and I think easy. Um, also, it should be very cheap because you're going to be doing an awful lot of it. The Unix philosophy, this program should do one thing really, really well, and hey, guess what? You can glue them together. Third idea, parsimony as a virtue. Do what's needed, but no more. Also, Glenn and I are, if you had to describe us, we're not so much developers as sysadmins, and by definition that means at least one of us is a very lazy individual. That would be me. Okay, now I think I'm gonna pass off to Glenn to describe our environment. I didn't tell him. Uh -huh. No, okay, whatever. <laughs> so, for any large organization, if you are an ISP, you probably have a core network where most of your traffic comes, passes through, and a large number of edge or leaf nodes. Um, this image here, on the far left, we have really happy network users who um, are able to get their email, uh, check their Facebook, update Twitter, do all the things that we do every day. Um, that in order to do that, though, they need to have reliable, robust networking. In each of the 300 plus, 300 plus buildings, um, on-prem, that is to say, outside of the data center, there is what we call a gateway or a demarcation, a demark switch. That switch connects that, that department's local network to the university's core. So these switches are not... Um, they're not in a data center. It involves coordinating, getting people out to site, getting hardware out there with them, get it configured, get it in place, and hopefully having it work in such a way where we don't have to go back and deal with it. 
On the other side, outside of the uh, square on the right, you have uh, a number of large routers or aggregation switches that are almost fridge size. Um, and those connect the, to the university's backbone that interconnects those uh, switches. So in this context, um, and we'll go into a few more numbers shortly, we, um, when, we, when Glenn and I came into this problem, the typical process for preparing a switch to be put, um, so preparing a new depart, uh, gateway or DMARC switch Getting that out into the field, it involved um, somebody unpacking the switch, setting it up, powering it up, plugging in a, an RS-232 cable to it, um, starting a procedure that was multiply photocopied, hard to read, and error prone. First thing you would do is format the device, and then you'd wait, and you'd wait, and you'd wait. And generally, if you're a NOC operator running a network, at a large organization, chances are you don't have what's called boring time. That phone's going to ring, something's going to happen. You're going, your attention is going to be brought somewhere else. You will be context switching. As a consequence, um, you might get past the up, upload firmware stage where you'd actually hopefully get to the next stage um, and wait for the switch to come back to you and say, okay, I've uploaded it. Um, can I start using this now? And you only have a few minute window in which you can actually hit the S key. And oftentimes, when you're fighting fires, the last thing that you're going to be looking at is that screen at the back of the room where this is plugged in. So typically, um, you get to the end, the process would time out, you'd be sad, you'd have to start over again, you'd be thinking of a career in possibly something safe, like, I don't know, firefighting. So to put it into a broader context, um, Central IT, we are effectively the university's internet service provider. We are more or less not a, not a residential or an um, individual provider. We provide two departments. So we're effectively a business to business, or if, if you want to put it in those terms. Each network has a local gateway switch, DMARC point. So 300, 330 at last count. The switch is on, on pre, is on client prem, not ours. So we need access. Our switches were at end of life and they had to be refreshed. The challenges that we had to do, that had to contend with, was the fact that when you open the box and pull that switch out, that nice, big, expensive managed switch, it was about as intelligent as the $20 um, Canada computer special. No real intelligence. No real um, capabilities there by default. Those had to be turned on. No, no configuration. The firmware, even though the machine was in the box, was out of date. So we had to update that. Uh, there was no web interface for configuring after the fact if you had to make different changes. Um, as I've described already, the upgrade process is all command line based and quite error prone. Timelines for us were a big concern because we had to get this done in a fairly small amount of time. So our problem statements were, what we had to accomplish rather, was we had to format the switch, for the switch storage, we had to upload the firmware, we had to get the, management, the web management interface installed, and the de base default configuration put in. Some of this we could only do by RS-232, so a USB to serial converter. Some of it we could actually do via network. Um, the, because we only had a small number of USB to serial connectors, we could only do one at a time. But once we got the past that part, we could in theory parallelize all the network uh, amenable steps. So the question then was, how could we actually parallelize, or script rather, the command line interface? And with that, I'll ha pass it on to my colleague. Thanks, Pete. I hope this doesn't give me feedback. It looks like it's going to. Maybe it stands over. Okay, so um, basically, what, what, if you're looking for the word Python, it's not going to come from me. It's going to come from Pete in a little, little later, because he basically wrote the wrapper around 
uh, what was uh, essentially just um, expect scripts that would, would sort of kick off the uh, loading of the firmware and then eventually the SSH commands to uh, grab the configuration of the switch. So he, the, whole, the theme he had here was like, uh, uh, was it big and small? Uh, yes. big, big problem, small, small pieces of software. So the expect script was, I'm going to guess, I, I took a look at it this morning after not looking at it for five years. It may have been 20 lines of code. It was not, uh, not a huge thing. And these switches are really quite simple. They never vary in what they're going to uh, give back to you. Um, you. You say, you know, download, uh, download the firmware. It just does it. There's no, there's a, there's no error checking involved. The, the script was really, really basic. So uh, in terms of the, an, another way to visualize this problem, you were talking about a refrigerator earlier. If you can imagine this console, and the, the desk beside it, so I'm free about this high, full of pizza boxes. We have three of them. This was the problem. The, 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 uh, I didn't say that. The stuff came in um, in a big pallet. So 3Com ship, shipped us, I don't know, whatever it was, 300 switches. And, and basically, uh, the most, what became the most time-consuming part of the job was taking it out of the cardboard box. We lay it out on the table and putting it back in the cardboard box is what was essentially the, the tough part. Um, but then, uh, basically, we would line, say, th about five of, five of the boxes like so in a row take the serial cable and sequentially after uh, uh, running the script to download the firmware, we'd update those and then uh, have them all five switches at a time talk to, through one central switch that was sort of our, uh, uh, basically connect, connecting them all. And then it would go through the, the, the uh, Linux box which Pete set up with um, the uh, Python script. And it was basically then going to control all of the further configuration of these switches. So, it was uh, about, I'm going to guess, 300 of these things we processed. When we first looked at this and talked to the people that were doing it before, it was taking them about a half hour for every, every switch if things went really well. And probably most days they didn't go really well, so every, every switch was taking maybe an order of an hour or two hours. So when you multiply that by you know, 300, it's a, it's a daunting task. But we were able to basically process this huge three pallet loads of, of uh, switches within probably, I'm going to say, a couple of afternoons. So it was really effective for us. Um, and uh, if U of T goes through the process again of upgrading switches en masse, or if any, anybody, th this is probably a pretty, pretty good solution because it's incorporating the kind of uh, Python script which is driving the whole, the whole thing and these command line interfaces, which were, um, you know, really quite simple, but, but they enabled uh, the processing of, of quite a quite a volume of uh, of equipment in a, in a short amount of time. Um, I'm not sure if uh, this is a good time to hand it back to you. What do you think, Pete? Okay. Yep. I didn't know that. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. okay. So Glenn has described how the solution was used. I'd like to talk about what the pieces were, and I'll show how they were put together. We knew that we'd have to use the TFTP server. So a quick show of hands. Who knows what TFTP is? Okay, for those who don't, it's like FTP, but no password. It's not anonymous. It's less than that. Uh, very insecure, which is why you only do it on private networks. Pixie server. Well, that's to hand off. Uh, your DTP server will hand you the IP address, but your Pixie server will actually help you install your machine. We didn't so much use that. Uh, we use the DTP part of it. Um, since the switches, as configured coming out of the box, have default usernames and passwords, we had to run this behind a firewall. Uh, we needed an RS-232 cable to USB, easy to get, Ethernet cable, a, an old decrepit Dell workstation, which was on its last legs and just kept on working just fine. No idea how that happened. Um, and a switch, and of course, we're, where would we get one of those? This is what the solution kind of looked like. Um, so. We have the box on the left, which is actually the workstation. There is the uh, TFTP server, Pixie server, uh, GCP server, NAT firewall. So everything on the right of that was protected. Everything on the left was the outside world, or at least another protected network. There were two Python scripts running on the box. The first one talked via the USB to serial connection through mini, um, this minicom to the switches, and it would kick off the, the initial pulling down of the firmware, the installation, and the reboot. After that, 
when the switch rebooted, um, we'd actually, it actually would be looking for an IP address. At that point, there was an SSHD running, a secure shell daemon. It was getting an IP address, but we had no way of knowing what IP addresses the switch had, or did we? Yes, because in the machines, that workstation DARP table, we would have the IP address handed to it by DHCP plus the MAC address of the machine. On the switch, the MAC address was there on a sticker. So that part got figured out. Um, we could then tell the second Python script, I call it do network, to shell into that switch, pull down the, um, pull down the remaining things, and put in the uh, configuration. And that's our process once completed, or at least as left. The knock operator would get everything put out. Should that be re is that readable? Set up the switch, um, connect the USB to RS-232, run first script, let it run, and eventually it would come back and reboot the switch. At that point, you could disconnect the, the RS-232, put it into the next switch, and repeat. Um, in another command line window, you could start the second script that would go and do the, do the um, network-based parts of the install. What was really nice about this is you knew when the, art, the serial part was done, right? Because then the switch would come back up, and you could then go pull it out um, and just like just keep trucking through everything that you had to do. The next question comes: How would you actually know that everything worked? What was our way of knowing that the configuration attempt was successful? Um, so traditionally, on different networking devices uh, at the university, we have a particular image. You might remember the mascot of U of T is a beaver, and there it is. Um, ASCII art, uh, this is probably as good as it gets here. I'm not sure I'd call it art, but it is uh, quite effective. If you see that image, that configuration has come in, and this is uh, in the area. If, you, if you've ever seen this before, you know, I know which department you're working in. Okay, so that's one problem set, one problem figured out. We decrement the counter. Um, our second problem, um, again, we have 300 some networks, um, all those switches on-prem away from central IT, um, and they all have different site-specific configurations. Some of them could be an address range, local responsible person, what room the switch is in, what the, what the network name is, things like that that are pretty straightforward. However, not all, um, not all departments are the same, not all our clients are the same. Some have really complex networks, some have very simple networks, some have something in between. Being able to capture that configuration for uh, later examination, for uh, learning from, for rebuilding that switch when bad things happen, well, we, we didn't have that at the time. So having time on my hands, I figured, hey, I can do that. Um, we still need to do a lot of things to a lot of stuff. Um, problem statement, basically what we needed to be able to do was to shell into the switch, dump the running config into a file, and unfortunately um, we, had, we had to remove line breaks and uh, page breaks, look against other versions of the configuration, and uh, let real live humans know that, hey, this has changed. Uh, we needed a list of switches, so IP addresses, um, some place to store that, this information, and then some of this some way of actually managing the text of the, the configurations. Stop me if you've heard this before. Okay, so what do we need? Well, we need a server to run this from. Okay, that's not terribly difficult. Uh, found one of the easiest ways to hold on to information is a relational database. So be nice to have things like, when was the last time we actually checked the switch? Um, what, what's the switch's metadata? Stuff like that. Source code management uh, repos are really good for managing source code and text files, but what's a configuration file on a switch? It's text. Hey, we could use that too. Um, I needed to write a script to connect to the switch, dump out the configuration, remove those page breaks, and then commit to the repository. And as far as um, what the repo would do there is it could then email you know, the actual humans to say things have changed. Um, and all I wanted to be able to do is to give that script the IP address of the switch to check and then where that file was going to go. The architecture of this setup, pretty straightforward. Um, 
the switches live on a, an out-of-band network, or at least their management interfaces live on an out-of-band network. So if you are in the department or in the outside world, you don't have access to that network. If you are in a very particular range here, you can talk to these switches. So it's one, one way to uh, build in um, security by design, security in depth. On the server inside the square, we had the um, source code management tool. So that was Subversion, although we could have used Git, we could have used CVS, Mercurial, Git, whatever. Um, we had a database of uh, switches and um, IP addresses, their passwords, etc. cetera. Um, one Python script, and all of this was called by cron. So if you're not familiar with cron, it's a daemon that runs on Linux, Unixes that um, actually, it's a scheduler for user land processes. Um, and then we, 10 minutes remaining, uh, we would then talk to individual switches. So one, one, two, one script to do this? Well, yes. My view, laziness is a virtue. I'm a sysadmin. Um, I want to leverage what I have. So the database is really good for doing things like, you know, managing access. When, when did I pull this record? I can write a little bit of uh, logic to do that for me. Subversion so already provides a means to manage our source files, and it has hooks for sending out email via a local MTA or a... Um, mail transfer agent. Um, that repository can be pulled down by multiple people in the networking area so they can check the configurations without having to go to a central place. They can't commit, but they do have read. Um, we can actually control how often that queue is hit through cron. We just change how many times an hour it actually gets pulled. Um, the Python script, the cron job, the, the subversion configuration, all of that's easy to edit. The not so easy but not difficult part were the database pieces, and those were considerably less uh, smaller size than the Python script that I wrote. Um, and uh, yeah, it's all in my documentation. No, it's not. Um, but the important thing is that how you get to that is made very clear. Um, the I'll get into that. So generally, the things that I, that I learned the hard way um, to get the required, start with understanding what it is you have to build before you build. I know with Agile, there is a, an idea that we're going to work in an iterative manner where we might not have all of the requirements. And that is a, that is a constraint that you work under. But generally, you, would exp you have at least some of the architecture done. You have some of the requirements drawn. You have enough to base your work from. My problem previously is I didn't, uh, I didn't understand sufficiently the problems that I had to deal with. So I spent a lot of energy doing things I probably shouldn't. I, as a, as a yeah. being a Linux sysadmin, I am acutely conscious and aware of the tools that I can leverage on my platform, whether it's um, through a bash script, through something calling different uh, tools, through database calls, through whatever. But leverage these as much as you can. The wheels are already there. They're round. They're well made. They're well kept up. Why reinvent them? Um, take these parts, glue them up as best you can using the tools you have. And then when you solve the problem, stop. All right? Stop there. You're done. Um, if you're going for 95% of, of all the possibilities, you've got it. You can now move on. And in my experience, um, good documentation and through written procedures and um, mentoring with the people who are running this tool, Glenn and others. I um, had a one-page written procedure, very clearly laid out. We revisited it many times, um, and really ugly or other command line scripts um, generally were, had provided a bigger value, a bigger bang for our, for our buck in terms of time invested. Um, compared to a, a program that we looked at that we didn't get documentation for or documentation that went through Google Translate um, and took a lot, would take a lot more resources in terms of people's time, money, and you know, resulting therapy afterwards. So the take-homes I would have for you is that big problems don't necessarily have to be big projects. Small programs can do big things. 
we leveraged the pieces we already had. The version of Postgres called expect. Um, look at databases as more, as more than a persistence layer. It can also house some of the business logic. Cron is great for scheduling. Subversion so has tools to talk to email. Sometimes, uh, as uh, Frank Boshoff uh, often say, sometimes all that's needed is to sprinkle a little technology in the right spot to make all the difference. So what we did today was sim talked about a project that was simple in means and rich in ends. There are a lot of people I'd, we'd like to thank. Um, colleague Glenn for actually suffering through reading my code. Um, Russell and Doug, Marcos, Marvin, uh, Sam, Bruce, Mike, Jen, everyone from the networking group at the time, Lloyd, Kevin, uh, Frank, Martin from the department. Um, it was a great pleasure to uh, be at the conference. This has been the best, uh, the best run conf technical conference I've been at in the last 10 years. So thank you very much to the organizers and everyone part of it. And uh, thank you all. And maybe we'll open the floor to questions. Thanks, guys. That was great. Uh, do we have any questions? Not all at once, though. Um, so do I understand that you have to, like, you still have to have a human there, like, pulling out the cable, sticking it in a router, and then, like, hitting enter on running a Python script? So you're sitting, you're sitting in front of a console, Linux box. There is a USB connect into, uh, sorry, USB cable plugged in. On the other side is an RJ45, but it's a serial connection. It, yeah, it works. It goes into the switch. You kick off the script, and it starts. Did you consider um, listening to the serial connection and like just having one script that runs, and you just had a human step removing the cable and sticking it back in? Like you just listen to the, the serial the, connection to make sure it's still active? That would be the right way to do it. Again, let me, let me go back to the earlier point. I'm lazy. Um, no, the, the cup, well, there's that, but also um, what's nice about a simple procedure that humans follow is if you have to tear it down and bring it back up, there's less to worry about. Serial ports are, they were in the past notorious for getting hung up on things that required power cycles to fix. So this approach kept it simple, kept the amount of code we had the right to a minimum, which was already pretty small. Um, and would also, you know, the user knew, the person actually doing the work, knew when to pull out the cable and transfer it, rather than having, um, having the signaling getting confused. I, we didn't run into that, because other than one day where they did 100 and change switches in one day, that really wasn't an issue. But it's a good, that's a really good point. Do I have slides available? Yes, they're actually already handed in to the organizers. If you come and find me afterwards, I will email them to you. Yep. They should, uh, the slides should be on, I guess, the website.